So let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Beijing, Zhou Mi is senior researcher at the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation. With us on set is Miret Mabruk. She's senior fellow and director of the Egypt Studies Program at the Middle East Institute. Ken Gichinger is founder, managing director, and chief economist at Mentoria Economics. He joins us from Nairobi. And from Johannesburg, Gideon Chitanga is a political economist at Political Economy Southern Africa, a Pan-African regional think tank. Welcome to all of you to the show. Xiaomi, let me start with you. Uh, this was Foreign Minister Wang Yi's first foreign visit for 2020. As we reported, he visited five African countries. Put this in uh, some kind of perspective for us. Why is Africa so important to China? Yeah, as we can see that this is uh, the 30 years that Chinese, uh, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs visited, uh, put the first visit out uh, in Africa because, you know, we have so many years of traditional cooperation and friendship. So I would say that uh, Africa is important to China. It is not only because of the economic relationship, but also because of the historic cooperation between our two partners. I would say that uh, in the new times that we are trying to establish the better foundations for future cooperation in many areas, which is not only between China and uh, separate uh, African, country, African country, but also as a, as a group, I, I would see that there are a lot of possibilities for both sides to cooperate in uh, much wider ranges. Mirat, let's talk about the visit to Egypt. Uh, China and Egypt have uh, quite a burgeoning trade relationship. It was worth $14 billion in 2018. Mm -hmm. And China, of course, is already involved mm -hmm. uh, in Egypt's development via the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. So how would you characterize the relationship between the countries? Um, I think burgeoning is a good way to put it. Um, uh, Egypt is very, very keen on the relationship. Um, I think um, uh, President Abdel Fattah Sisi has visited China, I think, six times since he took office in 2014. Uh, President Xi Jinping uh, visited the region twice, and I believe that uh, um, uh, President, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, it's sort of become traditional to put Egypt to visit Egypt first. In the case of Egypt, um, there is a lot of overlap. The Egyptians would very much like Chinese expertise, and the, the Chinese would like the opportunities to invest on things like renewable energy, electric cars, communication, high tech. Uh, all these are very, very promising markets. There's almost 1,600 uh, Chinese companies registered in Egypt at the moment. Um, um, the president, uh, President Sisi, wants um, an, um, an international industrial hub and logistics hub around the Suez Canal. So um, they, I think they're leaning heavily on the Chinese for that. Uh, um, and the, the Chinese want to be there because, of course, uh, Egypt's position and the Suez Canal is the shortest uh, um, shipping route between um, Asia and Europe. And uh, I think it's just the stars aligning, so to speak. Egypt, of course, uh, Miret is also uh, an important Middle Eastern country. Yeah. It's the biggest Arab country. Yes. Um, is there a strategic dimension to this relationship with China? There is. Um, so um, we have two issues. On Africa, Egypt is trying to position itself as a gateway to Africa. It's, it's well positioned to do so, um, but is, I think is, is going to have to try quite hard to, 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 to do that, but it is, it is trying to position itself to do so. And then, of course, you have the, um, the uh, African trade, the new continental African trade area, which is going to offer a huge market, 1.27 billion people. It's going to be the world's largest free trade area if it, if it comes off, and Egypt is very well positioned. Um, and then, of course, Egypt is a, has actually succeeded in making itself a regional environment, uh, um, a regional energy hub. And um, China's growth depends on an uninterrupted uh, flow of um, oil and gas. Uh, and then, of course, Egypt, um, you know, while its position is taken off, so Egypt is still a regional leader, and, and uh, um, it does bring a, a fair amount to bear in regional, uh, uh, in regional issues. So it's, it, um, it, it's a good place for the Chinese to be. 
All right, let's go to Johannesburg and bring in Gideon Chitanga. Uh, Gideon, of course, the foreign minister also visited Zimbabwe, and uh, Zimbabwe is facing very serious economic problems right now. It's uh, economy contracted by more than 7%. Unemployment is very high. Uh, there have also been some questions over the diversion of... Uh, development funds uh, to ease the foreign uh, currency crunch that the country was facing. However, the current country's foreign minister, he's very upbeat about the relationship with China. This is what he had to say. Let's listen. China and Zimbabweans can see opportunities within each other, which others are not seeing. And we believe that the continuous collaboration of this scenario would enhance the identification of opportunities which avail themselves here in Zimbabwe and also in China. From agriculture, to manufacturing, to tourism, to mining, and specifically even into the financial services sector. So, of course, uh, Gideon, we shouldn't forget that Zimbabwe is also facing international sanctions. How do you see China's involvement helping Zimbabwe? So, so we know from this visit um, at a political level that well, China has uh, is become uh, one of the major partners of Zimbabwe in the process of how the government is trying to respond to international sanctions. And, uh, the, and Minister Wang actually came out to express solidarity with the government of Zimbabwe and to say, to express the view that sanctions uh, bid for Zimbabwe, they're affecting the economy, e, 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 a perspective that is shared by SADC. So the voice of China in this context is very important. But also the fact that um, e, the, the, the two ministers, e, the foreign minister of Zimbabwe, together with Minister Wang, they also shared the sentiment that they are looking at... Um, at a political level, getting the two countries to strategically support each other on issues of mutual interest. So I think in that sense, China is a big player and probably will help Zimbabwe in intensifying the lobby against sanctions. Um, it, at the level of um, investment, it, China has remained maybe the only major country that is still uh, borrowing or providing substantial amount of loans to Zimbabwe. Between 2000 and 2007, it provided uh, about 2.2 billion. In terms of aid, we know from the, the 2019 budget in Zimbabwe that uh, China provided about uh, 136 million plus in terms of aid. It has also provided um, uh, material aid to cater for natural disasters. Um, it's playing a key role in trying to engage the government uh, to try and resuscitate various economic sectors which have uh, collapsed in the past uh, few years. And I think the government of Zimbabwe is looking to, towards China uh, for capital. Uh, in the clip that you played, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Zimbabwe refers to uh, China playing a role in, um, in the economy, uh, including the financial sector. Uh, there has been speculation in Zimbabwe that uh, China is likely to try and assist Zimbabwe to solve its financial crunch. So I see a big role for China, particularly because there aren't a lot of uh, countries that um, are partnering Zimbabwe in its development. So we can say China has remained and continues to be the all-weather partner and friend of the government and the people of Zimbabwe. Ken Gichinga talking about Chinese investment uh, in Africa. Chinese companies invested something like $72.2 billion in African countries. That was between 2014 and 2018. That's twice as much money as American companies have invested uh, in the continent. Uh, there has been some criticism of the Chinese involvement in Africa. There's been criticism that China imports primary uh, goods from uh, Africa, mainly minerals and things like that, and that it exports manufactured goods back to Africa, or that it brings its own workforce to Africa when it uh, invests uh, in the continent. Uh, what do you think? What does that investment bring to Africa? I think you're absolutely right. Um, China has been Africa's largest trading partner for the last 11 years in a row. Um, so definitely the Sino-Africa relationship um, has gone to a new level. 
And I think you're also absolutely right to say that uh, the trade balance has been heavily in favor of China. Yes, we talk about win-win scenarios, uh, but the reality is uh, some people win more than others. I think the conversation has been changing since uh, China adopted the, uh, the import uh, agenda, where they had the major import conference in Shanghai two years ago, where they pledged to buy more uh, uh, commodities from Africa. So right here in Kenya, we are seeing a lot more uh, avocado farmers exporting to, uh, to China, but uh, it's nowhere near enough to scale to, 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 to change that trade balance that has been highly in favor of China. So I think the future is really about how do we make African countries more competitive so they're able to really export high-valued produce. Xiaomi, me, uh, of course, China uh, offers a great deal of diplomatic and uh, political support to African countries, as we heard from Gideon a moment ago. Uh, if we look at a country like Zimbabwe, as I pointed out, this is a country facing international sanctions. What is the importance or the significance of this kind of uh, political support that China offers to African countries? And you know, we also have to remember that, as I pointed out, Zimbabwe faces economic sanctions from other parts of the world. Yeah, it is uh, important for our country to build up its uh, capacity of uh, development. So I would say that because of the sanction, there's a lot of things uh, uh, actually cannot happen between Zimbabwe and other countries. So I would say that uh, we know Zimbabwe is also uh, uh, good at uh, manufacturing in some kind of areas, and it needs some kind of resources provided by other countries. So uh, if the, the uh, things has happened and uh, so many years have passed and the government is trying to, trying to do something to improve the status, so we should so provide better uh, conditions for these countries to develop in the future. I would say the political uh, support is one of the uh, kind of support that uh, one country may need, especially for the uh, most uh, uh, the least developed countries or China some developing countries because they are not able to to do a lot of uh, cooperation as the developed countries and I would also mention that if we look at the uh, in investment from China in Africa we can see that uh, last year at, at least 20 percent of the investment are in the manufacturing. So it's, it is not only the primary goods, but we are also trying to do some cooperation like for the industrial capacities to improve the competitiveness of African out export. Marit, you know, during the Cold War, we saw this uh, battle for influence in Africa by the two blocs on the one side, the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, Eastern Bloc, as it was known, on the other side, the United States and its allies. Mm -hmm. Is there a risk that we could see the same thing happen now between China and the United States? I think you're already seeing it. I, I think um, it's sort of played out more nicely. And I think that there is more sensitivity to what the, the regions contested, if you like, uh, want and need rather than, than what the, the Eastern or Western blocs want. Uh, and I think there's been more of an effort to, to see what the crossover potential is. But I think you're, you're already seeing it. Now, the thing is, I think, I tend to think that China has a little bit more of an advantage in that there has been um, um, a sort of significant disengagement from the region, particularly from, I mean, largely from the, the Middle East, but also slightly from, from Africa, on the U.S. side that started under uh, President uh, Barack Obama and has sort of continued under President Donald Trump. And uh, the Chinese have been uh, um, have been quick to, to move in, um, and I think uh, you know for various reasons a lot of people are happy about it. It's not just the disengagement. The 2008 financial crisis hit the U.S. a lot harder than it did um, um, China, and like I said, there are overlaps, particularly in areas of uh, high tech investment and uh, um, um, green energy. Right and renewables. Talking about that disengagement uh, on the part of the uh, United States from the Middle East, and this is straying a little bit away from our focus on mm. Africa, uh, there's been a lot of speculation, not sure whether it's misplaced, about China's uh, goal to play some role, a significant role in the reconstruction of Syria. Um, do you see that happening? Um, I honestly think that it is early to discuss 
um, any sort of reconstruction in Syria. Uh, I should note that I'm not an Syrian expert, but I'm not aware of any Syrian experts who think that this is going to, ha I mean, that it, this is just around the corner and this is what everyone is waiting for. So it could for. be some time before that. It happened. could be. I think, it, I think it's going to be decades, unfortunately. Right. Uh, Gideon, uh, how does China persuade close allies like Zimbabwe to make its public finances more transparent? This has been one of the issues that Zimbabwe has faced. Uh, it's one of the criticisms that's been leveled at the Zimbabwean government. I think that's a very important question, and um, I suppose that behind closed doors, uh, there are a few issues that uh, Foreign Minister Wang uh, probably expressed to the government of Zimbabwe in terms of uh, uh, improving uh, quite a number of things, and um, particularly the handling of its finances, the way um, the, the, the Reserve Bank has been managed, uh, other things related to Zimbabwe's payment of loans. But, you know, where countries have a, a foundation or a solid relationship, I think it's easier to communicate and share problems in confidence. So Zimbabwe has a lot of contradictions. Some of them are systematic. Are systematic. Some of them can be broadly blamed on other things. So as much as China has provided support, and confidently so and reliably so, I take it that an open and frank conversation with the government in Zimbabwe in total confidence can and should and must happen so that uh, while China puts in um, uh, its uh, financial, technical and social capital and political capital that is in terms of aging Zimbabwe to improve its own situation, it is the responsibility of Zimbabweans and the government of Zimbabwe to also play ball and um, uh, listen and uh, be proactive in addressing the problems that are coming from the other end. And uh, I hear that there is commitment from the side of the government of Zimbabwe to address issues that uh, the government of China is raising with the government of Zimbabwe. Not only because these issues are emerging from the side of China, but there are, some of them are issues that have been what we raised by Western governments, which the government of Zimbabwe considers to be its uh, critic or, or enemies. So when something comes from a friend and it's said frankly and in, a, in, in the basis of trust, surely there is a way it, it rings. And so I'm pretty confident that the government of Zimbabwe and government officials in Zimbabwe where they are sitting, they are looking at each other and say, saying to themselves something must change. And if you want to continue uh, to have a confident relationship with our all-weather partner in, in, in China, then we have to at least see, be seen to be proactive and to address the key problems the country is facing. Ken, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, does China need to have these very open, or should I say candid, uh, frank conversations with its uh, partners in Africa right now to uh, improve the relationship that it has? <clears throat> well, I think we have to think about the long-term strategy of China in Africa. And obviously, for the last 20 years, it's been through the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation. That's been the umbrella arm. But obviously, China uh, treats uh, different African countries in different ways. So the strategy must be different. Some African countries are more strategic to China than others. That must be said. So I think when it comes to uh, countries, for example, that uh, heavily mineral, uh, heavy minerals, Obviously, we'll see China uh, approaching it from a, from a different perspective. I think it's part of strategic foreign relationship, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, the foreign minister, Ken, also visited Burundi and Eritrea, uh, both small countries, but very important countries in Africa. Uh, what is the nature of China's relationship with these countries, uh, and are they important to, the, to China's overall relationship with the continent? Oh, they are significantly important. If you think of, I mean, they, they are small geographically, mm -hmm. but they have a major strategic significance. Um, one particular example is the China Belt and Road Initiative, and in which we have major infrastructure connecting uh, both the big countries uh, through the small countries. That's one particular example where China needs the cooperation of uh, the bigger countries and the smaller countries. For example, with the standard gauge railway uh, that goes from Kenya all the way into DRC. 
So I think part of Chinese our strategic approach has been to teach to really treat each country as an equal partner in its own right, given that its long-term strategy uh, is to deal with them collectively. Zhou Mi, if we look at China's involvement in Africa, um, it sort of marks the uh, changing nature of international relations. In the past, many African countries, of course, had a close dependence on Western nations, uh, but now there is a close and closer relationship with China. There has been some concern, though, expressed over the fact that many of these countries are taking on loans from China that they will not be able to service. Uh, they could fall into the so-called debt trap. Uh, are these valid concerns? I would say that uh, it depends on what kind of uh, attitude or angles you, you can observe the situation. Because if you look at uh, the, the, the trade between China and uh, almost all the countries in the world, that uh, the trade volume is increasing. So if, we, if you just say that uh, all these countries depend more on China, but we can also say that China depends more on all these countries. So I would say that uh, for the for the trade in the in the world, we are trying to improve the conditions for the all the partners to trade. So if we can import more things from African countries, I think it's a good way. If mm -hmm. African can benefit a lot of uh, cheap but higher quality goods imported from China, I would say that is also good. If you look at some of the raw materials, you may find that uh, crude oil has benefited African countries for. Uh, for a lot, uh, even before the 2008, uh, when the price of the crude oil is much higher, was much higher than nowadays. And a lot of African countries benefit from that. But now, you know, after the crisis, uh, the, the crude oil also dropped its prices. So we see that uh, there are some of the countries' economic development has been slowed down. So I would say that if you try to Try to try to maximize uh, resources usage and uh, try to facilitate the trade between the countries. It would benefit the people because they can have better jobs and more employment, and that would also definitely be benefit the country and uh, you know both countries. Uh, Marit, going back to North Africa, China has been very critical of Turkey's military involvement in Libya, preparing yeah. uh, a political, a diplomatic solution to the political mm -hmm. crisis there. This is what Foreign Minister Wang Yi had to say. Let's watch this. Our stance is that the political solution is the only solution for Libya and other countries. Foreign and military intervention and the use of force will always lead to escalation of violence and complicating matters. We have established a joint committee that Minister Shukri and myself will head. It will plan and coordinate all forms of cooperation and policies between the two countries. So a joint committee has been established, but what does China bring to this, to resolving this conflict in Libya? Um, I think one of the most important things that China brings to it is that it has not been involved so far. Um, I think that the Libya, it's, it's some sort of a, a, a cliche to refer to things or, or situations as tinderboxes, but Libya really is very, very, very problematic. And I think what people in the region, um, certainly Egypt, because it's on the borders, are terrified about is that you're going to get another um, internal conflict that is going to turn into a proxy or conflict war, and you're going to have another Syria. Um, and it so happens that many of the, 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 the countries involved at the moment ha have been, in one way or other, involved in the conflict. I mean, uh, um, General Haftar's LNA has been supported by Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, uh, France, uh, and uh, um, the the internationally recognised uh, GNA at the moment has has you know is currently being supported um, in a fairly dangerous manner I think by uh, by the Turks who are looking to I, I mean who look like they may be about to up the ante by introducing uh, um, um, external military uh, external military uh, uh, aspect yeah. so I think the the biggest thing that China brings in I think is that it ha it doesn't have uh, an axe to grind at the moment. And um, it, you cannot overestimate the importance of that. Certainly doesn't bring any baggage with it. No, this. it doesn't bring any baggage. Get in, uh, Chitanga, one final point. Uh, you know, of course, over the past few days, we've been looking at the latest developments in this very long and costly trade war between the United States and China. 
Uh, it seems to be coming to an end right now. We have possibly the signing of a trade deal uh, later this week. Phase one of that trade deal will be signed here between the Chinese and the United States right here in Washington. This could ease trade tensions around the world. Uh, markets around the world have already responded favorably to uh, what they're hearing. Uh, will this have a positive impact on Africa as well? Yeah, certainly, you know that uh, the, obviously the, the trade war between um, China and the U.S. has a, a severe impact on all kinds of um, trade um, uh, implements that are shared globally. So Africa trades in, um, in a lot of uh, commodities from agriculture, mining, I think it's increasingly becoming a major source of gas, oil, and so on and so on. So we expect that um, if these two major countries, which are the biggest global consumers, in, and particularly China being, I think, growing bigger and bigger, are able to responsibly have a kind of a consensus and navigate not only trade relations, but political relations as well in a kind of a consensual um, way you be able to agree on critical global issues then they become a, their ability to agree is very important to their agency in each sector and policy that affects our issues globally so Africa, I think, would really benefit from uh, stable relations, e relations that are based on confidence and trust between China and the U.S., because that also allows prices of commodities to, to stabilize, but also improving the global system and how the global system functions. Right. Okay, we have to leave it there. We have run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.